On the morning of May 3rd, 2014, in a bustling four-star hotel in the heart of Guangzhou, a diligent housekeeper embarked on her daily task of tidying up the guests' rooms. She entered a room recently vacated by a seemingly fastidious guest, only to be greeted by an unexpected sight. The room was spotless, unusually so. Maybe the guest was exceptionally tidy, she mused, appreciating the ease it brought to her job. As part of her thorough routine, she started by sweeping and mopping, methodically working from the room's interior towards the exit. However, her routine took an abrupt turn upon entering the bathroom. The scene before her was startlingly different. The bathroom was flooded with a repugnant odor wafting through the air. She suspected a typical hair clog in the drain. Undeterred by this common nuisance, she reached for her trusty tool to unclog the drain. What happened next was anything but ordinary. As she cleared the blockage, a mysterious yellow object emerged from the depths of the drain. Piqued by curiosity, she carefully examined it, discovering its soft, pliable nature reminiscent of a chunk of yellow fat. Her seasoned experience in cooking kicked in as she scrutinized the substance further. To her growing horror, it resembled not the fat used in cooking, but something more sinister human body fat. The realization sent a shiver down her spine. Overcome with dread, she let out a piercing scream and bolted from the room. She rushed to the hotel reception, her voice trembling as she urged them to call the police. What started as a routine day had spiraled into a chilling discovery, setting in motion an investigation that would uncover deeply unsettling truths. As the police units descended upon the scene, their arrival marked the beginning of a meticulous investigation, piercing through the quietude of the Guangzhou Hotel. The forensic team, with their seasoned expertise, swiftly began their analysis. The unsettling discovery by the housekeeper, a fragment of fat, was soon identified as human muscle tissue from an adult female. This chilling revelation confirmed a recent murder in the now eerily quiet hotel room. The police swiftly cordoned off the hotel, transforming it into a sprawling crime scene. With a blend of methodical precision and urgency, they expanded their search. In the shadowed corners of a staircase, they uncovered a series of plastic bags, each one a macabre jigsaw puzzle of human remains, ominously devoid of the skull and leg bones of the victim. This find only deepened the mystery. The crime scene itself was devoid of clues, a testament to the perpetrator's meticulous efforts to erase their tracks. The police's next recourse was the hotel's surveillance footage, a digital eye that captured the comings and goings of its guests. The footage from April 30th unveiled the identity of the deceased, Yang Muqing, a woman who had checked into the hotel and retreated to her room, unaware of the fate that awaited her. The camera's unblinking gaze revealed more. Within a brief ten-minute window, Yang Muqing had descended to the reception, only to vanish from the camera's view forever. This stark timeline suggested a grim truth. Yang Muqing's life was brutally cut short shortly after her return to her room. Seeking more pieces to this harrowing puzzle, the police reached out to Yang Muqing's family. They painted a picture of a woman who had embarked on an early May vacation, her silence in the following days, an unheeded harbinger of tragedy. 
The questions that hung in the air were as palpable as the sense of loss. Who had Yang Muqing crossed paths with? What sequence of events led to such a savage end? The answers lay hidden, shrouded in the silent walls of the hotel room, waiting to be unearthed by the relentless pursuit of justice. The absence of theft from Yang Muqing's possessions led the police to deduce that the motive behind her murder transcended financial gain. Surveillance footage became a crucial witness, capturing Yang Muqing descending the hotel stairs to retrieve personal hygiene items, a detail that hinted at the presence of another person in her room. The lens of the hotel's cameras soon revealed a figure of intrigue, a man cloaked in anonymity, donned in a purple shirt, blue jeans, a hat and a mask, slipping into the hotel unregistered and heading straight upstairs. This shadowy figure haunted the corridors during Yang Muqing's stay, his comings and goings marked by a consistent clutching of personal belongings. Delving into Yang Muqing's personal life, the police uncovered a past marred by tragedy. Her husband's death in a car accident had plunged her into deep grief and a vow of eternal widowhood. This discovery cast the mysterious man in the footage under a shroud of suspicion. His final appearance on camera, carrying Yang Muqing's suitcase, escaped scrutiny amidst the bustle of May Day and the hotel's relaxed checkout procedures. The puzzle deepened as police scrutiny of the footage revealed the man's possession of a red plastic bag, possibly containing human remains. Forensic analysis chillingly suggested these remains matched the size of Yang Muqing's missing leg bones, with the likelihood of her severed head being concealed within the suitcase. The man's behavior, his constant toting of the bag, led investigators to a grim conclusion. They were tracking Yang Muqing's killer. Despite his concealed appearance, there was no hint of panic in his movements. Through urban surveillance, the police tracked his movements post-hotel. In a turn of events that defied conventional criminal patterns, the suspect didn't flee, but instead walked calmly to a vegetable market, carrying the grisly contents. The subsequent disappearance of the red bag suggested a macabre disposal of Yang Muqing's remains, possibly at a pork stall, a thought that chilled the spine. With urgency, the police intensified their search, leading to the discovery of the discarded red bag in a trash bin at a pork stall. DNA tests confirmed the horrifying truth. The remains were indeed Yang Muqing's. The methodical dismemberment indicated a perpetrator with professional training, possibly a doctor or a butcher, with an unsettling familiarity with the market environment. The investigation then took to the bustling market streets. Clues emerged from a motorcyclist's encounter with the mysterious man on May 3rd. His description, a man shrouded and enigmatic, offering a red paper in an unsettling gesture of silence, painted a vivid image in the investigators' minds. Armed with this lead, the police mobilized swiftly. Their investigation led them to Xinfeng village, where the man was believed to be hiding. Approaching the hotel with a blend of caution and determination, the police prepared to unravel the final chapter of this harrowing case, poised to bring the shadowy figure lurking in Xinfeng village into the glaring light of justice.
In the hushed corridor of the hotel, police officers stealthily approached the suspect's room. With a swift, decisive motion, they breached the door, revealing the startled face of the man inside. Zhang Jian, 35, was caught unawares. His reaction time outpaced by the swift action of the law. In moments, he was subdued, his brief moment of bewilderment giving way to the reality of his capture. The apprehension of Zhang Jian, a former inmate with a history of theft and robbery, proceeded without a hitch. His post-prison life as a pork butcher suggested a desensitization to the act of killing, a chilling precursor to his current accusations. Throughout the interrogation, he exuded an eerie calmness, almost as if he was detached from the gravity of his situation, anticipating imminent freedom. Confronted with the question of his motive for murdering Yang Muqing, Zhang Jian's response was coldly pragmatic. There was no personal vendetta. He was simply a hired hand. His refusal to divulge the identity of his employer, however, stymied the investigation, casting a shadow of mystery over the proceedings. The police, driven by necessity, delved deeper into Zhang Jian's past and connections, unveiling a complex web of relationships and coincidences. The tragic twist in the tale came with the revelation that Yang Muqing, once a happily married woman, had lost her husband in a car accident, an accident for which Zhang Jian was responsible. This sinister coincidence raised a myriad of questions. Was there underlying animosity between Zhang Jian and Yang Muqing? Could it be that he had not only caused the death of her husband, but had also been the orchestrator of her own demise? The possibility of a dark and twisted vendetta potentially rooted in a secret affair, hung heavily in the air, adding layers of intrigue and malice to an already convoluted case. Confronted with the weight of evidence arrayed before him, Zhang Jian's facade crumbled. In a moment of realization that his deception was untenable, he capitulated, confessing all to the police in a bid for mercy. His revelation was startling. The orchestration of Yang Muqing's husband's death was not solely his doing. Yang Muqing herself was the architect of the sinister plot. Yang Muqing, a strikingly attractive accountant at a state-owned enterprise, possessed a charm that didn't wane even in the bonds of matrimony, drawing numerous admirers. With time, her vanity was fed by this constant adulation, leading her to foster a frivolous disposition. This burgeoning vanity bloomed into a deep-seated dissatisfaction with her loyal and good-hearted husband, culminating in a complete emotional detachment from him. During this period, He Qiang, a figure of authority and influence, fell deeply for Yang Muqing. Their affair rapidly intensified. And as Yang Muqing's disdain for her husband grew, she sought to sever their marital ties. However, her husband, profoundly in love with her, could not bring himself to grant her a divorce. Frustrated and desperate, Yang Muqing confided in He Qiang about her husband's refusal to dissolve their marriage. She posed a chilling query. Could they compel him to relent, to pave the way for their union? 
This led to a nefarious pact with Zhang Jian, incentivizing him with 300,000 RMB to eliminate her husband. Zhang Jian, now a mercenary in this twisted plot, enacted their plan. He lay in wait on the route frequented by Yang Muqing's husband, striking with lethal force and staging it as a car accident. Yang Muqing, though inwardly exultant, played the part of the grieving widow to perfection, ensuring Zhang Jian evaded responsibility. After serving a brief prison term, Zhang Jian walked free, the truth of his crime obscured. In the aftermath, Yang Muqing was perceived by the world as a bereaved widow, a portrait of solitary mourning. Little did they know, she and He Qiang reveled in their covert relationship, basking in the freedom procured through their dark deed. To the oblivious onlooker, He Qiang and Yang Muqing appeared as nothing more than a devoted couple, shrouded in the guise of normalcy. As time passed, Yang Muqing's discontent simmered into a deep-seated dissatisfaction. Despite her drastic actions, orchestrating her husband's murder for He Qiang, she felt her grip on him slipping away. He Qiang, already divorced and her secret lover, persistently dodged commitments, fueling Yang Muqing's growing frustration and anxiety. Within her, a dark plan began to take shape. Yang Muqing, no longer content with being a hidden affair, issued an ultimatum to He Qiang, marry her or face public scandal. He Qiang, initially captivated by her youthful allure, had never envisioned a future tethered to her. Confronted with her demands and threats, he was driven to a desperate resolution. He sought out Zhang Jian, offering a hefty sum of 300,000 RMB to eliminate Yang Muqing, the very woman for whom he once professed love. On the fateful day of April 30th, 2014, under the guise of a romantic getaway, Yang Muqing requested He Qiang to book a hotel room. Obligingly, he Qiang set the trap, communicating the plan to Zhang Jian. Armed with the grim tools for a grisly task, Zhang Jian shadowed Yang Muqing into her room, where he coldly executed the murder. Methodically, he dismembered her body, erasing her existence piece by piece. Over three days, he shuttled the remnants from the hotel, blinded by the lure of the money awaiting him, unaware of the impending grip of justice. The harrowing truth eventually unraveled. He Qiang, the mastermind cloaked as a lover, was apprehended and cast into the snares of the legal system alongside Zhang Jian. Both now faced the stark reality of their crimes, awaiting judgment and retribution. In this twisted narrative, the most poignant tragedy lay with Yang Muqing's unsuspecting husband. His death, shrouded in ignorance and betrayal, would have remained a mystery had Yang Muqing's own fate not led to its revelation. He perished, tragically unaware that his demise was orchestrated by the one he cherished most. This case starkly illustrates the far-reaching arm of the law, unyielding and thorough, ensuring that every transgression receives its due punishment. Yang Muqing, driven by selfish desires, fell into a web of manipulation, ultimately meeting a fate she never envisioned. 
the moral decay of Yang Muqing and He Qiang, their utter disregard for the sanctity of life, stands as a chilling testament to human fallibility. This lamentable tale serves as a stark reminder. Embrace kindness, sincerity, and integrity in all dealings. Life's ephemeral nature renders material possessions and shallow pursuits meaningless in the grand scheme. The price of sacrificing one's soul and loved ones for unrequited love or fleeting desires is a toll far too heavy to bear. Let He Qiang's downfall be a cautionary tale against the destructive path of infidelity. In a world rife with temptations, maintaining a heart of sincerity, a spirit of diligence, and an unwavering adherence to moral and legal principles is paramount. Let this story be a dialogue starter on the importance of upholding ethical standards and respecting the sanctity of life. Share your thoughts and join the conversation in the comments below. When I say that, I will never fully understand why this has happened or why it happened to my sister. But since those questions are beyond our understanding, I think it is best to consign ourselves to the will of God. Annie was always the same little girl that has and will always be in our hearts and in our prayers. Jitu, I miss you and I will always love you. Annie J. Thu Lei born on July 3rd, 1985, in San Jose under the clear blue skies of California, was a cherished member of a loving and tightly knit Vietnamese American family. From the moment one met Annie, she left a profound impression. Her demeanor was friendly, approachable, and gentle. Yet, beneath her soft exterior was a brilliant scholar who commanded admiration and awe with her remarkable academic achievements. Annie was extraordinarily intelligent from a young age. She graduated as the valedictorian from her high school in Eldoret, California, where her peers affectionately nicknamed her Windstorm for her unstoppable excellence. Upon graduating high school, Annie was awarded a full scholarship worth $160,000 to pursue a degree in cellular developmental biology at the University of Rochester, New York. Excelling in her undergraduate studies, she graduated in 2008 and continued her academic journey at Yale University, a prestigious institution within the Ivy League recognized for housing eight of America's most distinguished universities. Annie was nearing the completion of her PhD in pharmacology after five years of research. Her work at Yale's laboratories had significant implications in treating diabetes and certain types of cancer. Beyond her scholarly prowess, Annie was actively involved in extracurricular activities and even contributed an article to a medical journal titled Free and Safe in New Haven, Crime and Safety at Yale, reflecting on the safety within the university campus. Annie was not just a shining star in the eyes of her professors and peers, but also a pride and dream of every parent. She was confidently striding on her chosen path with a promising and expansive future ahead of her. In her personal life, Annie had it all, a flourishing career and a blossoming love story. 
At the University of Rochester, she fell in love with her best friend, Jonathan. Like Annie, Jonathan was an exceptional student raised in a well-to-do family. Following their graduation, the couple embraced a long-distance relationship as Jonathan pursued his PhD at Columbia University in New York, while Annie moved to New Haven, Connecticut to continue her studies at Yale. Before embarking on this new chapter, Jonathan proposed to Annie. They planned to marry on September 13th, 2009. Annie eagerly counted down the days to her wedding, unaware that fate had a tragically different plan in store. On September 7th, 2009, Annie Lerr faced an exceptionally busy day. In addition to completing her research projects at the university, she was also preparing for her wedding, just six days away. Feeling anxious and stressed, she called a close friend to confide in. Although eagerly anticipating her wedding day, Annie sometimes wondered if the decision was made too hastily. However, after the conversation, she felt reassured. Marrying Jonathan, the man she wanted to spend her life with, felt like the right choice. The next day, September 8, 2009, was filled with tasks that needed to be completed in the laboratory before her flight to Long Island the following day, where her wedding would take place. Annie left her apartment early in the morning and took the bus to the university, arriving at her basement laboratory at 10.11 a.m. She spent most of her time working on her research involving white mice in room D13. As the day progressed, classes ended, students left the campus, and buildings were gradually locked. Unusually, Annie, who typically returned home before 6 p.m., was nowhere to be found. Known for her cautious nature, she never stayed out late or walked alone at night. If working late, she always ensured someone was there to accompany her home. By 10 p.m., Annie had not returned home and no one could contact her, which was completely out of character. Her housemate decided to inform the police. When officers arrived at Annie's university workplace, they discovered her keys, wallet and phone were left behind. She hadn't used her bank card or phone all day, indicating she had only planned to be in the lab for a short time before returning to her office. She had only taken her access card when leaving the room. Security cameras confirmed Annie entering the building at 10.11 a.m carrying what appeared to be research materials. Although the footage didn't provide a complete picture, it was clear that Annie showed no signs of distress upon entering the building. She wasn't rushing, looking worried, stopping to talk to anyone suspicious, or behaving out of the ordinary. It was just another regular morning for her. Unfortunately, the laboratory's basement had only one camera which failed to capture any images of her. At 12.50 p.m., a fire alarm sounded and everyone in the building was evacuated. The police continued their investigation by reviewing footage from 70 security cameras, but they couldn't find any further trace of Annie. The university offered a $10,000 reward for information about Annie, while her fiancé rushed over from New York and her family from California arrived in New Haven to join the search. The mysterious disappearance of PhD student Annie Lowe created a sense of panic and fear across the university campus. The incident quickly garnered significant attention from the media and the public. 
The university advised students not to speak to reporters to avoid spreading unfounded rumors, which could affect the general morale and the university's reputation. Some speculated that Annie might have run away due to cold feet about her impending wedding. However, those who knew her found this theory ludicrous. Annie and her family had been planning the wedding for over a year, and she was not known to act impulsively or disregard others' feelings. On September 12, 2009, the police deployed a team of forensic experts to re-examine the building, focusing on Annie Lee's laboratory in room D13. During this inspection, they discovered faint bloodstains on a wall in room D13. Another investigative team found beads from a necklace in the storage area of room D22, which was identified as a necklace commonly worn by Annie. Upon examining the ceiling, they discovered a blood-stained sock and a blue medical glove. The police used a chemical called luminol to test for blood in room D13 and adjacent laboratories. Luminol, which can detect blood diluted up to 10,000 times, emits a faint blue glow upon contact with blood, revealing blood stains that cannot be completely cleaned. Under the luminol light, blood spatters appeared not only in room D13, but also in room D22. Following these blood trails, the police proceeded to the male staff changing area and the office restroom of D22. During their search, the police detected a foul odor emanating from an unidentified location. A canine unit was brought in to scour the entire building, and eventually the building had to be closed off as the scene of a homicide. On September 13, 2009, the decomposing body of Annie Ler was discovered stuffed upside down into a wall containing water pipes in room D22. What should have been her wedding day, a day of beauty and happiness, tragically turned into a day of mourning as her family had to identify her remains. Annie's petite body was severely contorted due to being forcefully stuffed behind the small wall. Forensic examination revealed that Annie had died from asphyxiation with a broken jaw and clavicle, injuries inflicted while she was still alive. The examination also indicated signs of sexual assault. Evidence collected included Annie's access card, a medical glove, and a blue pen found near her body and from the surrounding area. These items were sent to the laboratory for further analysis as part of the ongoing investigation. As news of Annie Lee's tragic death spread, Thousands gathered at the Yale University campus to light candles and pray for Annie and her family. The university community was deeply affected, with students and staff feeling uneasy. In response, the university sent out an email informing students of the enhanced counseling services and the availability of a 24-7 support line for anyone in need of emotional support. The university's strict security system, which required access codes or entry cards for building access, led to the theory that the perpetrator could be a student or staff member, causing widespread fear and apprehension. As a precaution, students moved in large groups and evening classes and activities were cancelled over safety concerns. The investigation took a turn when DNA evidence from the crime scene matched Kia Robinson, a criminal who had died five years prior. This discovery baffled the police, 
until they learned Robinson had previously worked as a plumber in room D-22, explaining his DNA presence there. Upon reviewing entry card records, the police found that only two individuals had accessed room D-13. The first, a lab equipment supplier, was quickly ruled out as a suspect due to a solid alibi. The second individual, a 24-year-old lab technician, became the prime suspect after his statement conflicted with security camera footage. Known for his temper and intolerance for untidiness in the lab, he had a strained relationship with Annie. The only known interaction between Ray and Annie was an email from Ray complaining about Annie leaving dirty mouse cages after her experiment. Despite some colleagues defending Ray as serious and disciplined, he had no criminal record. Security cameras showed that Ray entered rooms D13 and D22 a total of 55 times between 10.40 a.m. and 3.04 p.m. on September 8th. He was also seen leaving the building with others during the fire alarm and returning at 1.10 p.m., apparently having changed his uniform. Further, security footage captured Ray sitting outside on the steps, holding his head in his hands. During a second interrogation, the police noticed fresh scratches on his face and arms, as well as new bruises. Ray claimed they were from a cat scratch. Asked to take a polygraph test, the results indicated dishonesty, but they were not legally sufficient to warrant an arrest. While waiting for DNA results, the police had no choice but to release Ray as the investigation continued. Uh, shortly after 5 p.m. this evening, the Connecticut State Police the Western District of the Major Crime Squad located the remains of a human secret within a wall inside the building at number 10 Amistad Street. On the early morning of September 17th, 2009, the area around boarding house number 8 was bustling with the presence of dozens of police cars. The police, with an arrest warrant for Ray, quickly set up barriers and a group of FBI agents headed straight to room number 24. They found Ray and his father having breakfast and without hesitation, the police handcuffed Ray right in front of his astonished father. DNA tests had confirmed Ray as the perpetrator of Annie Lee's murder. During the search of Ray's home and workplace, the police discovered the uniform and shoes he wore at the time of the crime, still stained with Annie's blood. They also found blue pens identical to the one found next to Annie's body. All this evidence, combined with Ray's access card history, became incontrovertible proof implicating him in the crime. Investigators believe that Annie was murdered just before the fire alarm went off. In the struggle, Ray accidentally triggered the alarm, then left Annie's body in the laboratory and exited with everyone else. Upon returning, he moved Annie's body to room D-22 and stuffed it behind a wall. Public speculation about Ray's motive was rife. Some suggested that he harbored unrequited love for Annie and acted out of jealousy when she announced her upcoming wedding. However, this theory was disputed by many as Ray was also engaged to someone else. Others thought that Ray, feeling inferior and controlling in his lab job, acted out of envy towards the research students. Nonetheless, his true motive remains a mystery to this day. In March 2011, after several trial delays, Ray pled guilty to murder and was sentenced to 44 years in prison. 
Despite expressing deep remorse, he never explained his reasons for attacking Annie. Ray is expected to be released in 2053, at the age of 68. Although Annie's life was brutally taken away, she continues to be remembered by her loved ones as the most wonderful woman they ever knew. Annie will forever live in the hearts of those who knew her. In 2017, Japan was gripped by a chilling mystery. The disappearance of a young woman leading to an investigation that unearthed a horrifying series of crimes. This dark tale unfolded in Kanagawa Prefecture, nestled within the bustling Tokyo metropolitan area with the city of Yokohama at its core. The central figure of this tragic narrative was 23-year-old Tamura Aiko from Hachioji City. Her family, comprising her parents and an older brother, was plunged into despair by her sudden vanishing. Tamura, a quiet and socially reserved individual, had left school after junior high and lived with her mother following her parents' divorce. Tragedy struck in May 2017 when Tamura lost her mother to illness, a devastating blow that sent her spiraling into mental health challenges. Diagnosed with schizophrenia, her condition deteriorated, necessitating care in a psychiatric facility. Despite the physical distance, her brother kept a lifeline of support through social media offering words of comfort and hope. But in October 2017, Tamura mysteriously disappeared. During the frantic search, her brother uncovered a string of crimes that sent shockwaves throughout Japan. The fate of Tamura and the other victims became a pressing, haunting enigma begging for resolution in this unnerving chapter of Japan's criminal history. Turn the clock back to October 23rd, 2017. It was a Monday marked by silence, the third consecutive day without word from Tamura deeply worrying her elder brother. Concerned about her fragile health and propensity for impulsive decisions, he decided to scour her Twitter for any hints of her whereabouts. A tweet from September 20th sent chills down his spine. It was a haunting plea for a death companion. I want to die, but not alone. Willing to join? DM me. In Tokyo. Ready to meet. Do you have a car? Among several replies, one was particularly disturbing. Use drugs or alcohol to dull the fear. My loft is available for this. Tamura's response, 21 days later, was one of sheer desperation. Can we do it today? I have just 1,000 yen. Can we proceed tool-free? Where are you, male or female? These exchanges set off alarm bells for her brother, fearing a sinister encounter. In a bid to find her, he posted a missing person notice on her account describing the mysterious man and seeking public help. 
After a fruitless day, he turned to the police. Their investigation swiftly led to a pivotal clue. Tamura was last seen at Hachioji Station at 13.45 on October 23rd, accompanied by a man in his mid-twenties, distinguished by shoulder-length black hair and a slender build. They were tracked traveling from Hachioji to Machida Station, then taking the Odawara line to Sobudaimai Station in Zama City, a significant distance from her home. By 1404, they had arrived. By 7 p.m., they had both disappeared from the station. The case took a turn when an internet user who had interacted with the man contacted Tamura's Twitter with information. They arranged a meeting with the man for October 30th at Sobudaimai Station. Anticipating danger, the police advised the woman not to go and sent undercover officers instead, Tamura's brother in tow. That afternoon, the surveillance team identified a man matching the description from the footage, seemingly waiting for someone. With caution, they followed him to a nearby two-story boarding house, a mere 750 meters from the station. The man ascended to his room with the police in pursuit. Greeted by a repugnant smell upon knocking on his door, they were met with a grim sight as the door swung open. Tamura's brother spotted her white bag inside. Upon questioning about Tamura, the man chillingly gestured towards an icebox, suggesting her presence within. The layout of the house was simple yet foreboding. Upon entry, to the left lay the bathroom and kitchen, above which a small attic was perched. The living room, where the grisly discovery was made, was situated in this immediate area. The police discovered eight boxes, and upon opening a freezer directed by the apprehended man, they uncovered an appalling scene. Hidden beneath layers of cat litter, human heads and various bones were found, the remains of those who had been missing for days. A rapid inspection of the eight boxes in the living room revealed that seven contained dismembered human bones, while the eighth was a chaotic pile. The man was swiftly restrained, and a significant number of police officers were deployed to the scene, commencing an official investigation. At the crime scene, apart from a box with toxic substances, the remaining seven boxes held a total of nine human heads and 240 bone fragments amidst a pervasive stench of decay. The police also found a saw scissors, a rope, and a series of other incriminating tools, along with several pairs of shoes and leather wallets in a blood-stained bathroom. The forensic examination determined that among the nine victims, one was male. All had been dismembered, and their causes of death were yet to be ascertained. The most recent passing was less than two weeks prior, and the oldest, approximately three months. Outside the house, as news spread, a crowd including numerous journalists gathered. The police covered the crime scene with blue tarps. Neighbors, questioned by the police, reported no unusual noises attributed to the proximity of the railway. However, many locals had noted a foul odor since a man moved into the second floor of the building. 
By November 9, 2017, 16 days after the incident, police identified the nine victims through DNA matching. These included Miura Mizuki, a 21-year-old office worker from Atsuge, Kanagawa Prefecture, 15-year-old high school student Hongye Ishihara from Komatsuga District, and others aged between 17 and 26, many with mental health issues. This case sent shockwaves through Japanese society, raising questions about how the perpetrator managed to commit nine sequential murders in a matter of months. The identity of the suspect was subsequently revealed. Takahiro Shiraishi, born in October 1990 in Zama City, emerged as a central figure in a series of chilling incidents. At 27, unemployed and residing just 2.8 kilometers from his family home in Komatsuha, Zama City, his life trajectory was shadowed by complexity and darkness. His family, consisting of his parents and a younger sister, lived a seemingly ordinary life. His father was an auto parts designer and his mother a homemaker. But beneath this veneer, Takahiro harbored a deep-seated self-centeredness and a disregard for others' emotions. His childhood was marked by aloofness. In elementary and junior high, he was a withdrawn figure, barely noticeable, even in his graduation photo. Family discord, culminating in his parents' divorce, saw Takahiro choosing to live with his father. This period saw him increasingly disengaged from school, taking up part-time jobs with the aim of gaining independence. It was during this time that he made a failed attempt at suicide, using burning charcoal alongside others with similar intentions. Post high school, Takahiro found employment at a supermarket where he was noted for his work ethic and skills. He later transitioned to an electronics company, simultaneously engaging in the darker world of pimping and associating with unsavory characters. In August 2012, at 22, Takahiro ventured into Tokyo's notorious Kabukicho district, a hub of adult entertainment. He took a job recruiting women for a local establishment, earning a substantial income of up to 300,000 yen, about $2,200, monthly, inclusive of referral fees and commissions. Despite this, his extravagant lifestyle left him with little savings. February 2017, marked a turning point when Takahiro was arrested in Kabukicho for trafficking a girl, resulting in a 14-month suspended sentence and three years of probation. During probation, he briefly worked for a logistics company before returning to Zama, Kanagawa Prefecture. Back home, Takahiro's life became one of seclusion spending days in a darkened room, immersed in the online world. In Japanese culture, such withdrawal is not uncommon, stemming from various societal pressures. 
Japan, with a tragic statistic of 70 suicides daily, predominantly male, has the highest rate globally. Takahiro tapped into the dark undercurrents on Twitter where discussions of death and suicide were rampant. He created five Twitter accounts, one for public discourse on these morbid topics and four for private interactions. He skillfully manipulated these platforms to connect with vulnerable individuals. From this moment, Takahiro Shiraishi embarked on a heinous journey, exploiting the vulnerabilities of those in despair, setting the stage for his eventual descent into murder. In August 2017, 27-year-old unemployed Takahiro Shiraishi's path crossed with Miura Mizuki, a 21-year-old office worker, through the digital realms of Twitter. Mizuki, who endured bullying in high school, struggled with adjustment disorder and often found solace in Twitter's darker corners. It was here that she connected with like-minded individuals, sharing her despondent thoughts. In a twist of fate, Mizuki narrowly escaped death during a planned group suicide at the beach. This close call led her to Takahiro and another online acquaintance, 20-year-old Takugo Nishinaka. The trio convened in a park, conspiring a joint suicide pact. However, Nishinaka, after a moment of introspection, chose to step back from the brink, opting for a renewed lease on life. Mizuki, rattled by Nishinaka's withdrawal, informed Takahiro she too would not proceed. Nonetheless, over time, Takahiro cultivated a close online rapport with Mizuki, discovering her significant savings. Viewing her as both a romantic and financial target, he meticulously laid out a diabolical plan. Takahiro began amassing tools, a saw, rope, and leased a room near Sobudaimai Station later infamous as the site of his grisly axe. Its affordability and lack of surveillance rendered it a haven for his criminal intents. Under the guise of needing a deposit for the apartment, Takahiro enticed Mizuki into paying 510,000 yen, about $3,600. Three days after moving in, he orchestrated a meeting with her at the apartment. There, he drugged her drink with sleeping pills, and once she succumbed, he executed his premeditated murder with a rope he had prepared. Facing the aftermath as a novice in crime, Takahiro spent three days meticulously dismembering Mizuki's body in the bathroom. As decomposition set in, he resorted to storing body parts in the refrigerator. Night after night, he discreetly disposed of the remains in nearby bins. The challenge of severing and disposing of the head led him to purchase ice boxes and cat litter, using them to conceal the head among their contents. This meticulous and macabre process marked the beginning of Takahiro's descent into infamy. On August 28, 2017, Takahiro Shiraishi's grim sequence of crimes continued this time ensnaring 15-year-old student Hongye Ishihara. 
Ishihara, a reserved girl who enjoyed connecting with new friends online during her junior high years, frequently found herself at odds with her mother about her studies. After a particularly intense argument, she fled from her home. It was during this period of vulnerability, while scouring social media, that she encountered Takahiro. Following his established modus operandi, he enticed her to his apartment, where he replicated the same ruthless actions he had inflicted on his previous victim. The mysterious vanishings of Mizuki and Ishihara set off alarm bells for their families, who quickly alerted the authorities. Investigations pointed to a chilling coincidence. The last traces of their mobile phones were near Sobudaimai Station in Zama City. Despite thorough searches in the vicinity, the police unearthed no leads. Takahiro, cloistered in his apartment, remained undetected and beyond suspicion. The saga took another dark turn with 20-year-old Takugo Nishinaka, a young man grappling with high-functioning autism. A painful breakup precipitated a hospital stay, and a subsequent encounter with his ex-girlfriend pushed him to the brink of suicide, only to be narrowly prevented. His struggles at work added to his growing despair, nudging him toward suicidal thoughts. Takugo, who knew Mizuki, reached out to Takahiro when he couldn't contact her. After meeting Takahiro, his desire to end his life surprisingly abated, and he even communicated his newfound determination to live on to Takahiro. However, Takahiro, sensing a potential threat in Takugo that might link him to Mizuki's disappearance and thus draw police attention, acted swiftly. He lured Takugo to his apartment under a guise, drugged him and executed him in the same manner as he had with Mizuki and Ishihara. With three victims now within the confines of his apartment, the odor of decay became overpowering. In a desperate attempt to mask the smell, Takahiro tried cooking the remains, but the stench persisted. Neighbors, although aware of the foul smell, attributed it to a nearby sewer and did not probe further unwittingly allowing Takahiro's heinous acts to continue unchecked. Undeterred by his sinister acts, Takahiro Shiraishi continued his macabre spree after executing three horrific crimes. He soon found a romantic partner online who, unaware of his dark deeds, moved into his apartment with him. His next victim was 19-year-old university student Sarake Hinako, battling mental health challenges following a reprimand from her mother. On September 15th, 2017, Seizing an opportunity when his girlfriend was out, Takahiro lured Sarake Hinako to his lair, perpetuating his murderous pattern. In quick succession, Takahiro targeted 26-year-old Hitomi Fujima, a divorced mother grappling with her child's disabilities and fraught familial ties. Her despair, voiced on Twitter amidst a second divorce and eviction, caught Takahiro's predatory eye. 
Their meeting took a sinister turn when a call from Hitomi's ex-husband threatened to disrupt his plans, prompting him to swiftly and ruthlessly end her life. To mitigate the odors emanating from his increasing number of victims, Takahiro ingeniously modified the apartment's ventilation system. His relentless spree claimed four more lives, totaling nine women. A chilling detail emerged. The ninth box at the crime scene, ominously empty, was intended for a tenth victim. But the timely intervention of the police prevented further tragedy. The case's complexity and the imperative for thorough evidence gathering delayed the trial's commencement for nearly three years. Finally, on September 30th, 2020, proceedings began in Tokyo court. Takahiro's confession was juxtaposed with his defense's plea for leniency due to alleged mental health issues. Throughout the trial, he expressed remorse and extended apologies to the victims' families. The court, however, found no grounds for leniency, sentencing him to death on December 15, 2020. In the aftermath, Twitter's Japanese branch urgently revised its policies, banning content related to suicide and self-harm and ensuring prompt removal of any violations. This harrowing case underscores the sanctity of life and the importance of resilience in the face of despair. It reminds us to seek help and support in our darkest moments, for circumstances can and do change. This video concludes our exploration of this tragic tale, but the lessons it imparts remain. Until we meet again in future videos, goodbye and remember to cherish every moment of life. This was an extremely serious case that at the time led to internal conflicts within the Japanese government over the rights granted by the law to protect those under 20 years of age. Moreover, it was considered a significant milestone in Japan's legal system as it was the first time a person under 20 in Japan faced the death penalty due to the brutality of the crime committed. So, what really happened? And what was this crime? Join me in today's video to explore further. Let's turn back time to April 14th, 1999, a Wednesday shrouded in mystery. At 7 p.m., after a tiring day at work, Hiroshi Motomura returned home to his apartment complex, stopping in front of Dr. Number 41 on the fourth floor. The first oddity he noticed was a loosely placed newspaper outside the door. An unusual sight, since his wife, Yayoi, typically brought it inside. Upon entering, Hiroshi was struck by the chaos inside. The apartment was dark, objects were scattered, 
indicating some kind of struggle. His wife, Yayoi, and daughter, Yuka, were nowhere to be found. A frantic call to his mother-in-law yielded no clues. They hadn't left the house with their usual backpack. In panic, Hiroshi rushed to the bedroom wardrobe where he discovered a horrifying scene. Yayoi, unclothed and motionless, wrapped in a blanket inside the wardrobe. Hiroshi's heart nearly stopped as he realized his wife was no longer alive. The criminal investigation unit arrived quickly, sealing off the area. Investigations revealed that Yayoi, 23, had passed away with her mouth sealed with tape, hands bound, showing signs of assault. Young Yuka was also found lifeless in the upper compartment of the wardrobe, her body bearing multiple injuries. In the kitchen, remnants of a hurried meal lay scattered, along with a spilled milk bottle. The victim's wallet had been rummaged through, with cash and discount coupons missing. There were no clear signs of forced entry. Police determined the time of death of the two victims to be between 10.30 and 11 a.m. on the same day. Hiroshi was ruled out as a suspect after his colleagues confirmed his presence at work all day. Neighbours reported seeing a man in his 20s dressed as a maintenance worker near the apartment complex that afternoon. Some also heard the cries of an infant and noises from Hiroshi's apartment between 2 and 3 p.m. Surveillance footage revealed that around 2 p.m. the man in the maintenance uniform entered building number 7 where Hiroshi's family lived and left at 3.30 p.m. The uniform was identified as belonging to a local service company. By April 18th, police located an employee from the service company who was absent on the day of the murder. The investigation continues to unfold in the hopes of soon uncovering clues to solve this horrifying case. Just four days after a horrific murder shook the community, police apprehended the main suspect, Takayuki Fukuda. Witnesses confirmed he was the enigmatic maintenance worker seen on the day of the murder. Born on March 5, 1980, the 18-year-old Fukuda came from a family of four, including his grandparents, parents and a younger brother, two years his junior. Fukuda's life was shadowed by darkness from an early age. His father, an addict of gambling and alcohol, frequently abused Fukuda's mother, especially when money was tight. This led to a severe deterioration in her mental health and ultimately her tragic suicide by hanging when Fukuda was in middle school. Following his mother's death, Fukuda's father remarried. Fukuda, grappling with deep emotional pain and a declining mental state, struggled academically and became engrossed in the world of adult magazines and films, developing a strong fixation on sexual matters. In 1999, at the age of 18, Fukuda graduated from high school and started an apprenticeship as a plumbing technician at a local company. He officially joined the company on April 1st, 1999. 
However, just eight days later, on April 9th, he began skipping work, choosing to spend his time in video game arcades instead. Fukuda returned to work on April 13th. Notably, his father and Hiroshi, the husband of the murder victim, were colleagues in the same company and lived in the same apartment complex allocated by their employer. This proximity likely facilitated the conditions for Fukuda's criminal actions. After his arrest, Takayuki Fukuda recounted the events of April 14, 1999, the day of the chilling murder. Fukuda, reluctant to work yet donning his maintenance uniform to avoid his father's reproach, left home at 7 a.m. Instead of heading to the company, he aimlessly wandered the streets and returned home for lunch, pretending to have been at work. Dark thoughts emerged in Fukuda's mind, a desire to engage intimately with a woman. Armed with rope and duct tape, he entered various apartment buildings under the guise of a maintenance worker. Fukuda knocked on the doors of individual apartments, searching for young women home alone. With each unsuspecting resident, his boldness grew. At 14.20, Fukuda entered building number seven and ascended to the fourth floor, where he knocked on Hiroshi's door. Yayoi, 23 years old, opened it, holding her baby, unsuspecting of the man in the worker's uniform claiming to check the water pipes. Once inside, Fukuda sneaked into the kitchen and bathroom under the pretext of inspection, simultaneously scouting to ensure they were alone. Confirming that only Yayoi and her infant daughter were present, he suddenly attacked Yayoi from behind in the living room. Despite her fierce resistance and screams, she was no match for Fukuda. In a panic, he strangled her, silencing her cries. Fukuda then bound Yayoi's hands with rope and sealed her mouth with duct tape. When her 11-month-old daughter began to cry, he angrily threw the child to the ground multiple times. Eventually, in a heinous act, he strangled the infant with a rope until there was no response. After his brutal acts, Fukuda meticulously cleaned the crime scene. He used cleaning solutions to wipe away fingerprints and traces, then hid Yayoi's body in a wardrobe and placed her daughter in a plastic bag in the upper compartment of the wardrobe. Before leaving the scene, Fukuda rummaged through Yayoi's wallet, stealing cash and vouchers. He then spent the money on snacks and went to a friend's house to play video games, acting as if nothing had happened. Fukuda's crime was not only brutal, but also left a lasting impact on the society and the victim's family. In June 1999, the Yamaguchi District Prosecutor's Office filed a petition to the Supreme Court for the case of Takayuki Fukuda, requesting the death penalty. However, the petition was rejected under Japanese law, which only considers individuals adults at the age of 20. Since Fukuda was just 18 when he committed the crime, he was protected under the juvenile law established in 1948, providing lighter sentences for those under 19. On August 11, 1999, the case officially went to trial at the Yamaguchi District Court. 
Hiroshi, the husband of the victim, brought portraits of his wife and daughter to court, but was prohibited from displaying them due to concerns about affecting the defendant's emotions. Hiroshi felt insulted by this request, but complied. During the trial, Fukuda entered the courtroom with a desolate expression. Reminded by his lawyer, he bowed to the victim's family and apologized. However, his demeanor suggested a lack of genuine remorse. After seven months of trial, on March 22, 2000, the Yamaguchi District Court sentenced Fukuda to life imprisonment for murder, rape, and theft. Hiroshi, the victim's relative, expressed outrage at the verdict and disappointment with the legal system during a press conference after the trial. The prosecutor later met with Hiroshi, expressing sympathy and a commitment to continue appealing the case. Subsequently, Hiroshi regularly appeared in interviews, hoping to broaden the impact of the case. He criticized the legal system's excessive protection of juveniles, overshadowing the rights of victims. On March 28, 2000, shortly after the verdict, the Yamaguchi District Prosecutor's Office appealed to the Hiroshima High Court for the death penalty for Fukuda. However, this appeal was rejected on March 14, 2002, on the grounds that Fukuda was only 18 at the time of the crime and immature in thought and character. Throughout the prolonged appeal process, the prosecution gathered additional evidence, including letters Fukuda wrote to friends while in prison. The content of these letters revealed a disregard for the law and a lack of remorse, even mocking the victims and the legal system. The persistence of Hiroshi and the prosecution team garnered empathy and support from the public. This story reflects not only a horrific crime, but also a protracted legal battle, challenging the fairness and rights of the victims in the judicial system. In June 2006, a shocking decision by the Supreme Court of Japan stirred up a storm in the legal system. The initial verdict of the Yamaguchi District Court in Fukuda's case was annulled and the case was sent back to the Hiroshima High Court for retrial. This event quickly captured the attention of lawyers across Japan who opposed the death penalty as they decided to join Fukuda's defense team. Their aim was not only to save Fukuda from the death sentence, but also to reconsider the flaws in the legal approach to capital punishment. The number of lawyers defending Fukuda skyrocketed from just two to 21, forming a powerful and diverse defense team. Among them was Yoshihito, a prominent criminal defense attorney with experience in several high-profile cases. On May 24, 2007, the Hiroshima Supreme Court opened a new trial session. In this trial, Fukuda, who had previously admitted to intentional murder, suddenly retracted his confession. He claimed that he never intended to kill but that it was a case of manslaughter. The defense team shifted their legal strategy, presenting new arguments to improve Fukuda's standing in the eyes of the law and the public. Fukuda's lawyers argued that he grew up in a violent environment and witnessed his mother's suicide at a young age. 
They claimed that the loss of his mother drove Fukuda to seek the warmth and intimacy he had lost, leading to his decision to embrace the victim. However, when the victim resisted, the situation escalated, resulting in her unintended death. Additionally, the defense presented an unbelievable argument to explain Fukuda's violation of the victim's body. They suggested that Fukuda's actions were guided by a fantastical belief that sexual relations with the corpse could resurrect the victim. They even referred to the Doraemon manga, where Fukuda believed hiding the body in a closet could summon Doraemon to solve his problems. To support these claims, a psychiatrist was brought in to testify that Fukuda might have been mentally unstable and out of control when committing the crime. The defense also accused the prosecution of deliberately portraying Fukuda as a brutal criminal to secure the death penalty. These arguments from the defense team caused surprise and even outrage among the public. Some people even suggested punishing the lawyers for their irrational and incredible reasoning. The case became not just a legal debate, but a focal point of public attention, raising questions about legal ethics and how criminals are handled within the judicial system. On April 21st, 2008, Following a series of intense court hearings, the prosecution presented a crucial piece of evidence, a letter written by Takayuki Fukuda in prison to a friend. The frivolous and unrepentant tone of the letter shocked the judge, contradicting the image of a suspect capable of future remorse. Consequently, the Hiroshima Supreme Court decided to impose the death penalty. By February 20th, 2012, the Supreme Court of Japan had ratified this death sentence. Fukuda's defense attorneys attempted to appeal based on a psychiatric assessment that suggested Fukuda had the mental capacity of a 12-year-old child. They used this information to argue against the death penalty, claiming the case was a severe miscarriage of justice and that Fukuda did not intend to rape and murder. However, in October 2015, the Hiroshima Supreme Court dismissed the request for a retrial due to insufficient evidence. Despite continued efforts, the appeals were unsuccessful. Meanwhile, Fukuda's father resigned from his job to conceal his identity, feeling detached from his son's actions. Simultaneously, Hiroshi remarried a colleague seven years his senior, moved by her support for his quest for justice. Under Japanese law, after being sentenced to death, the accused still has time to appeal. However, the final decision on executing the death penalty depends on the approval of the Minister of Justice. Yet, such execution orders are rarely issued, making actual death penalty cases quite infrequent. Finally, in December 2020, nearly 21 years after the crime, the Supreme Court of Japan officially rejected any further appeals from the defense and maintained the death sentence. Fukuda was left to live with an impending death over his head in prison, uncertain of when his last day would come. In the Japanese judicial system, 
Criminals sentenced to death are not informed of their execution date in advance, only being notified a few hours before the death penalty is carried out. This creates a state of perpetual uncertainty and tension for individuals like Fukuda, who live in constant anticipation of their final day. The story of Fukuda is not just a criminal case, but also a lesson on the inevitability of retribution for evil deeds. It serves as a testament to the fact that, although rarely executed, the death penalty remains an integral part of Japan's legal system. Almost a year since 16 year old Leanne Tiernan from Leeds went missing. Police investigating her murder arrested a man today. On August 20th, 2001, a fateful call from Lindley Wood, situated on the border between North and West Yorkshire, sent shockwaves through the police force. The caller, a dog walker, trembled with a voice laden with panic as he reported the discovery of an unusual large package seemingly hiding a human body inside. Upon the police's arrival, an oppressive atmosphere engulfed the forest. Unwrapping the package revealed the lifeless body of a young girl, enveloped in a patterned cotton blanket and a black plastic bag. More horrifically, she was wrapped in nine green plastic bags, with yellow cable ties binding her neck and hands, and her arms tied tightly behind her back. The cause of death was identified as suffocation, marking a tragic and mysterious end to the young girl's life. Who was this girl, and how did this tragedy unfold? Will the perpetrator be caught? Immediately, the local police initiated a thorough investigation, reopening all the unsolved missing person cases. Not long after, using distinct physical characteristics and DNA, the police swiftly identified the victim as Leanne Tiernan, a young girl who had mysteriously disappeared nine months earlier. Let's travel back in time to the eve of Christmas in the year 2000. Leanne Tiernan, a bright 16-year-old girl along with her friend, visited a bustling shopping center in the city to buy Christmas gifts. After their shopping spree, they parted ways, unaware that this would be the last time Leanne was seen. The incident took place in Leeds, the geographically central city and the third largest in the United Kingdom, with an economy second only to London, making it a prosperous and desirable place to live. Leanne, born in September 1984 to parents Michael and Sharon, who had divorced during her childhood, was a cheerful and resilient girl with excellent grades. She was a beloved and confident student at Wesleyan High School. However, an unforeseen tragedy struck her just before Christmas. But what exactly happened to her on that fateful day? 
On November 26, 2000, a special Sunday with only a month until Christmas, Leanne Tiernan, a 16-year-old student, decided to enjoy her day off with her best friend, Sarah Whitehouse. They headed to the vibrant shopping center in Leeds to select Christmas presents. Immersed in the festive atmosphere of the city, they wandered through stores before catching a bus back to their homes in Bramley, located in the northwest of Leeds. Around 4.50 p.m., they alighted in Bramley and walked to Howley Lane, where they said their goodbyes. Leanne continued her journey through a dark path, cutting through a small forest to reach her home, while Sarah lived not far away. Upon reaching home, Sarah quickly called Leanne to ensure her friend had safely arrived. To her surprise, Sharon, Leanne's mother, answered the phone, informing her that Leanne had not yet returned. Sarah grew anxious, knowing the short distance between their parting point and their homes. If Sarah had arrived, Leanne should have too. Leanne's mother began to worry, but tried to reassure herself that Leanne might have met friends on the way or stopped somewhere near home. However, as 5.20 p.m. approached and Leanne still hadn't appeared, Sharon's worry intensified. Usually, if Leanne met friends or decided to go somewhere unexpectedly, she would always call home to prevent her family from worrying. But that day, there was no call from Leanne. In a state of fear, Sharon decided to call Leanne's mobile phone, but strangely, after a few rings, the call was disconnected. She tried several more times, but the result was the same. Why wasn't Leanne answering? This was truly unusual and worrying. By 7 p.m., with no sign of Leanne, Sharon's worry turned into real fear. Realizing something was amiss, she decided to inform the local police about her daughter's disappearance. The case began to unfold into a dark mystery, sparking a vast investigation in search of any trace of the young girl. Following the report of Leanne Tiernan's disappearance, the police quickly initiated an investigation. Investigators immediately headed to Leanne's home, and based on the description from her mother, they realized the urgency of the situation. A plan was formulated to focus the search around Leanne's home, starting from the point where the two girls had parted ways. Leanne's last known path led through the desolate and densely wooded Howley Gill on her way home. It was a prime suspect for the scene of her disappearance. Over 200 police officers and volunteers were mobilized that very night to comb through the forest, seeking any trace of Leanne. However, the first day of searching yielded no results. By November 27th, the police began tracking Leanne's mobile phone. They discovered that her phone had been briefly activated before being permanently turned off. All attempts to contact her through messages and calls went unanswered. Subsequently, the police deployed a thorough search of each house along the route Leanne would have taken home. They scoured approximately 800 homes, garages, and 150 shops within an 800 meter radius of the forest, but found nothing suspicious. Simultaneously, another team sifted through garbage near the forest, while helicopters and canine units were deployed to aid in the search. 
Despite these extensive efforts, no clues were uncovered. Undeterred, the police persisted in their efforts, collecting DNA. The window of opportunity to find Leanne was slowly closing, yet the police and community continued their relentless efforts. The investigation turned into a race against time, a battle waged amidst despair and unease. Their unwavering determination to uncover the truth was a testament to their commitment to justice and the search for Leanne. One week after the disappearance of Leanne Tiernan on December 3rd, the Leeds community united in a concerted effort to aid the search. A local businessman, moved by compassion, generously donated £10,000 as a reward, hoping to stimulate valuable information from the public. The growing media attention resulted in a flood of calls to the police with reports of Leanne sightings, yet none led to a positive outcome. Leanne's parents made a heartfelt appearance in the media, expressing their profound gratitude for the public's support and assistance. They reaffirmed their unwavering hope and the family's longing for Leanne's safe return. By December 4th, nine days into the investigation, a witness contacted the police. They reported seeing a man walking a dog near the forest around 5 p.m. on November 26th, the day of Leanne's disappearance. The man was described as being 1.73 meters tall, slightly overweight, with a round face marked by redness and scars, wearing a black woolen hat a coat and jeans. Using details provided by the witness, the police created a composite sketch of the man and widely publicized it, hoping for an identification. And 3.2 kilometers of sewage pipes, making it the largest search in West Yorkshire's history. Despite these extensive efforts, the case remained stagnant due to the lack of crucial leads and Leanne Tiernan was still missing. On August 20th, 2001, nearly nine months after Leanne Tiernan's disappearance, a critical call jolted the police. The caller, a dog walker near Lindley Wood stumbled upon a mysterious large package that seemed to contain a human body. Panic-stricken, he immediately contacted the police. Lindley Wood, straddling the border between North Yorkshire and West Yorkshire, swiftly became the focal point of the investigation. Upon arrival, the police uncovered the package to reveal a chilling sight, the preserved body of Leanne Tiernan, who had been missing for nine long months. Remarkably, her body had been meticulously preserved, leading forensic experts to study her heart tissue and microstructures. Their analysis based on the state of decomposition and the temperature at the time of discovery, suggested that Leanne might have been kept in a refrigerator after her murder, only placed at the scene weeks before her discovery. Furthermore, the autopsy revealed that the wire tied around Leanne's body was a special material, produced by a specific company and sold in limited quantities typically used for making rabbit wire mesh. This discovery provided a significant clue in the investigation. Additionally, a few strands of red nylon carpet fibers were found on Leanne's clothing, but more notably, a human hair was found on her neck. Laboratory tests determined that the hair did not belong to Leanne, suggesting it likely belonged to the perpetrator. 
This hair became a key piece of evidence in the hunt for the person responsible for the tragic death of the young girl. Thus, the disappearance of Lian Tiernan was confirmed as a homicide, prompting the police to launch Operation Conifer. The location where the waste was discarded became publicly known, urging the community to be vigilant about anyone suspicious or frequently seen near the area. This led to a cascade of leads from various sources. The police collected DNA from approximately 200 individuals, among them a man named John Taylor. Born on August 27, 1956, a divorced resident of Leeds became the focus of the investigation. John, who lived about 1.2 kilometers from Leanne's home, became a suspect due to witness reports of him loitering around Lindley Wood. Neighbours described him as kind and trustworthy, known for keeping several small animals. The police discovered that the leather collar found around Leanne's neck was produced by a company based in Nottingham. Upon further investigation, it was revealed that this company had sold three orders to addresses in Leeds, including one to John. Additionally, the yellow cable ties found on Leanne's neck and hands were traced back to an Italian manufacturer, predominantly sold to Royal Mail. John was employed as a courier for Parcel Force Worldwide, a subsidiary of Royal Mail. Crucially, DNA analysis from the forensic laboratory confirmed that the hair found on Leanne's body matched John's DNA. On October 16, 2001, nearly two months after Leanne Tiernan's body was discovered, the police arrested John Taylor. They sealed off the garden and the wasteland behind his house, where they unearthed three large refrigerators, yellow cable ties, and green plastic bags similar to those used to bind Leanne. Intriguingly, Red carpet fibers were found on a nail on the floor, which, upon analysis, matched the fibers found on Leanne's clothing. Pollen experts also collected samples from John's garden and analyzed them in the lab. The results showed a precise match with the pollen found in Leanne's nasal cavity and on her hair. This evidence strongly suggested that Leanne had been in John's garden before her murder. These findings, combined with DNA evidence and other information, formed an irrefutable chain of evidence, placing John Taylor at the center of the investigation. Faced with an array of undeniable evidence, John Taylor confessed to his heinous actions. He admitted that on the day Leanne Tiernan disappeared, the 26th, he had been in the desolate Holy Gill Forest. When at his house, Taylor confessed to overpowering Leanne, leading to her desperate struggle. During a scuffle, Leanne fell off the bed hitting her head on the floor. In a state of panic, Taylor claimed he inadvertently caused her death by strangling her with a scarf. He then wrapped Leanne's body and disposed of it in Lindley Wood, claiming her death was accidental. When questioned about his motive for abducting Leanne, John merely responded, I have no comment. The police doubted Taylor's testimony, suspecting that he had deliberately assaulted Leanne, tying her hands and covering her mouth to prevent identification. They believed the coat, said to cover Leanne's head, 
fell off during the struggle, allowing her to see John's face, which might have driven him to murder her to silence a witness. A significant contradiction in John's statement was his claim of panic and immediate disposal of the body in Lindley Wood. However, police information indicated that Leanne had been kept in a refrigerator for an extended period before being discarded in the woods. This discrepancy revealed that Taylor's account did not align with the evidence collected, raising questions about his true motives and actions. These details painted a dark portrait of a cold, calculated individual who meticulously planned and concealed his crime. The act of preserving the body in a refrigerator, along with the use of cable ties and special materials for binding and gagging the victim, indicated a premeditated and not impulsive act. Despite John's attempts to downplay his guilt or hide key details in the case, the combination of modern technology, scientific analysis and thorough investigation enabled the police to clearly outline Taylor's brutal and calculated behaviour, shedding light on the tragic demise of Leanne Tiernan. court session, verdict for the murderer and exposure of other crimes. On February 15, 2002, over a year since the incident occurred, the trial of John Taylor took place at the Leeds Crown Court. Here, John admitted to the kidnapping of Leanne Tiernan, and a detailed hearing ensued. By July 8, 2002, after five months of trial, John finally confessed to the murder charge and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Detective Inspector Gregg, the lead investigator on the case, expressed his belief that this might not have been John's first crime. The calculated manner in which he executed and concealed his actions led the police to suspect that he might have been involved in previous killings. With these suspicions, the police decided to reinvestigate unresolved sexual assault cases in the vicinity of Howley Gill Forest. The relentless efforts of the police led to the discovery of John's involvement in two other sexual assaults. On October 18, 1988, a 32-year-old woman was attacked near the Holy Gill Forest while picking up her child from school. On March 1, 1989, a 21-year-old woman was assaulted in her home by a masked man wielding a knife. DNA evidence from these cases eventually linked John to these crimes. On February 2, 2003, John admitted to these two past offences in court. Following this, the West Yorkshire Police conducted a review of over a dozen unresolved cases, including five murders possibly linked to John. This affirmed the suspicion that John could have been a serial sexual predator over the past 20 years. John was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, condemned to spend the remainder of his life behind bars for the atrocities he committed. On September 28, 2001, Leanne Tiernan's family held a funeral for her on what should have been her birthday. Leanne will forever remain a 16-year-old girl in the memories of her family and community.
of federal officials have been praising the collaboration here. They tell us that it was only after the investigation into the disappearance of Edna Suttles did they discover that this man was responsible for killing three other women. We're glad he's behind bars. It is without a doubt that if it were not for the diligent investigative efforts by this team of investigators, this man will most likely be free on the streets, continuing to prey on innocent victims. There is no more serious offense than taking the life of another, and yesterday's life sentence was a small measure of justice for these families. On a serene October day in 2021 in Traveler's Rest, a woman was organizing her tasks for a house cleaning job. But today, something seemed out of the ordinary. Near the edge of the house lay an unusually placed bag. Approaching it with caution, she discovered the bag was filled with various women's items. What initially appeared to be just discarded objects turned out to be a crucial piece of evidence, unraveling a chain of endless atrocities committed by a serial killer. This discovery would soon reveal a much grimmer truth than mere abandoned belongings. Rewinding to August 27, 2021, in the charming town of Traveler's Rest, perched on the border between North and South Carolina, the stage was set for an intriguing mystery. Edna Suttles, an 80-year-old retired businesswoman and the esteemed proprietor of One Freedom Bail Bonding, was a prominent figure in her community. Known for her vibrant involvement, she was not just a successful businesswoman, but also a guardian angel for the elderly, often reaching out to assist and care for them. Miss Suttles had carved a formidable niche for herself in the northern part of the county. More than a bail bonding agent, she was lauded for her street smarts and resilience, earning a sterling reputation. Her presence was commanding. She was a figure of respect, and not one to be underestimated. On this destined morning, Miss Suttles had an appointment to visit a homebound friend. The family of her friend awaited her eagerly, but in a twist of fate, Miss Suttles never reached her destination in Greenville County 1, her unexpected absence was the beginning of a baffling case that would soon grip the town. Greenville County 911, what's the location of your emergency? The thing is, a sitter was supposed to show up to be with my mom today, and she's in her 80s. And she didn't show up. We'd come to her house, and we can't get nobody to the door or anything. Her name is Edna Suttle. This is not like her. She shows up like clockwork. So something's wrong. In many areas, the rule of thumb is that an adult isn't considered missing until 24 hours of no contact. However, the Greenville County Sheriff's Office, influenced by the Suttles case, revamped this norm. Before, missing persons reports were made over the phone, but marking a significant shift in policy due to the Suttles case, deputies now physically attend to each report, particularly under unique or medically urgent circumstances. In Edna Suttles case, Deputies were sent for a wellness check at her residence. Their efforts to make contact were futile. Following a search warrant, they entered her home, finding no sign of foul play or clue to her whereabouts. Conspicuously, her champagne-colored Jeep Grand Cherokee was missing, igniting initial suspicions of an untoward event. 
The police swiftly sprang into action, broadcasting alerts through local media. They provided a description of her vehicle, its license plate number, and noted her potential need for urgent medical care. Unknown to them at the time, Suttles had already encountered a tragic end and had been transported across state lines. It was only seven days later, on September 3rd, that a pivotal discovery was made. A local police officer located the Jeep in the parking lot of the Best Western Hotel in Traveller's Rest. The vehicle was strategically parked to conceal its license plate from easy view, adding another layer of intrigue to the unfolding mystery. Despite finding that Suttles had not checked into the hotel, the Greenville County Sheriff's Office diligently scoured the hotel's security footage from the day of her disappearance. They hoped this would shed light on the perplexing disappearance of Edna Suttles, a case that had rapidly evolved from a missing person report to a compelling mystery engulfing the town. The surveillance footage became the pivotal lead that investigators desperately needed. It captured the Jeep arriving at the parking lot, but startlingly, Edna Suttles was not the driver. Instead, a man emerged from the vehicle, meticulously cleaning it, with particular attention to the front passenger door, door frame, and quarter panels. He briefly left the scene, only to return for a final meticulous wipe down before disappearing. In many missing person cases, the reasons are often harmless. An impulsive trip, a personal crisis, or an unplanned romantic escapade. However, this footage marked a dark and foreboding turn in the Suttles case. The possibility of her voluntarily staying away was rapidly diminishing. The investigator's new challenge was to identify this mysterious man and reconstruct the sequence of events leading up to the 1.46 p.m. timestamp captured in the video. They needed to account for crucial hours earlier in the day when Suttles had planned to visit a friend. In an age dominated by surveillance technology, the team embarked on a meticulous journey to piece together the day's timeline. Armed with a specific date and time, they scoured footage from multiple locations across the town. Their diligence was rewarded. At 9.22 a.m. on August 27, 2021, a Chevrolet Cruze was spotted entering a Food Lion parking lot in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Eight minutes later, Suttles was seen leaving her home in her Jeep, as recorded by a nearby antique stores camera. By 9.38 a.m., the man later identified exiting her Jeep at the Best Western was purchasing strawberry yogurt cups at Food Lion. He used a store rewards card, revealing his identity as Prince. Moments later, Suttles pulled into the lot and parked near Prince. He approached her carrying a grocery bag, then took a small bag from his car and joined her in the passenger seat of her Jeep. They left the parking lot shortly thereafter. A significant gap ensued until 1.43 p.m. when the Jeep was seen leaving Suttles' residence and heading towards the Food Lion once more. At 2.02 p.m., the vehicle re-entered the lot and parked in a different spot. Prince then emerged from the driver's side and walked over to his Chevy Cruze, strategically positioning it beside the Jeep. The surveillance footage then captured a chilling scene. Prince moved from his car to the Jeep, transferring something or someone. Upon closer inspection, it was clear that he was moving a person, identifiable by their distinctively blonde hair, reminiscent of Suttles. He then drove off in her Jeep, 
leaving the motionless figure inside his cruise. Within minutes, Prince parked the Jeep at the Best Western. He meticulously cleaned the vehicle, being careful to leave no trace, then returned to the Food Lion lot. At 2.14 p.m., the footage showed Prince re-entering his cruise, where the lifeless figure of Suttles lay and driving away. This was the final piece of video evidence as the trail subsequently went cold. However, a critical piece of evidence emerged from Prince's grocery purchase. The rewards card he used at Food Lion led the investigators straight to his address in Bostick, North Carolina, about 70 miles away in the rural expanses of Rutherford County, North Carolina. This new lead provided a significant breakthrough in the investigation, edging the authorities closer to unravelling the harrowing events of August 27th. At the heart of this enigmatic case was Daniel Glenn Prince. But who was he? And how did his path tragically intersect with that of Edna Suttles? Hailing from Michigan, Prince had moved to the picturesque, mountainous region of North Carolina years earlier, finding solace in one of the secluded hollows of Rutherford County. This area, known for its hospitable community, also provided the perfect backdrop for those desiring privacy. Prince and his wife embraced this setting, and he quickly established himself as a handyman, particularly sought after by elderly, single, or widowed women. His knack for handiwork, combined with his ability to cultivate trust and camaraderie, made him a well-liked figure among his clients. However, beneath this facade lurked a tumultuous past. In his younger years, Prince had joined the military, seemingly trying to veer away from a life inclined towards misconduct. His military tenure was short-lived, and he soon reverted to criminal activities. His record was stained with charges ranging from assault and battery to firearms violations. Most concerning was his 1997 conviction in Michigan for kidnapping a woman, leading to a 13 to 30 year prison sentence. After serving 12 years and being paroled, he moved to North Carolina post his parole termination two years later. Detectives now had more than just surveillance footage and a timeline. They had the identity of a man with a history of kidnapping. The Greenville County Sheriff's Department promptly contacted the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department, their counterparts across the state border. With substantial evidence pointing to auto theft, an arrest warrant for Prince and a search warrant for his property were quickly issued. The Rutherford County Sheriff's Department was keen to support the operation. Prince, remarkably composed, surrendered to the array of heavily armed officers who converged on his property. Totally cooperating, just for life. Can I do everything? Can I cooperate? Oh my God. Stand up on your feet. Stay right there. Yeah. Sir, I would be very cooperative. All right, let's try that. This marked a crucial turn in the unfolding investigation, bringing a new level of intensity and urgency to the search for answers in the perplexing disappearance of Edna Suttles. In his interrogation, Daniel Glenn Prince presented an inconsistent story insufficient for direct criminal implications. However, a search of his property unveiled alarming evidence, notably a large collection of illegal firearms, including two AR-15S with removed serial numbers and about 20 handguns. This violation escalated the case to federal level due to Prince's status as a convicted felon prohibited from owning firearms. Further investigation at his home revealed a darker narrative. Officers found the driver's license and passport of Nancy Rigo, 
a missing 66-year-old widow, along with her wallet and financial documents listing Prince's address, suggesting possible financial exploitation. Communication patterns with Rigo's family raised suspicions of impersonation. The search also unearthed belongings of Rigo's deceased mother, Dolores Sellers Gore, and prescription drugs, enhancing suspicions around her death. Additionally, a black bag containing zip ties, a taser, lubricant, and crushed Ativan pills indicated potential nefarious activities. Despite Prince's claims of innocence in Suttle's disappearance, the evidence accumulated painted him as a possible serial predator. The investigation began unraveling a dark and hidden aspect of Prince's past, revealing a menacing side previously unknown to his community and his wife. While Daniel Glenn Prince remained in jail, his personal life began to unravel dramatically. His wife, overwhelmed by the shocking discoveries, made the difficult decision to sell their home and property. In the process, she called upon friends to help clean up the land and tend to the various poultry that roamed the premises. During this time, a friend venturing to the remote fringes of the property made a startling discovery. A large white box cleverly concealed deep in the woods at the land's edge. This box, unbeknownst to Mrs. Prince, contained secrets that would further implicate her husband in heinous acts Disturbed by the find, she promptly notified the authorities. Responding with a new search warrant, deputies from the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department unearthed a chilling collection within the box. Among the contents were Edna Suttle's purse, her Jeep keys, rope, zip ties, and other personal effects. Notably, an open yogurt cup matching the brand and flavor Prince had bought on the day Suttles disappeared, was also inside. Nearby, they found a car's rear floorboard panel, a black plastic bag, and a tarp. This panel was identified as belonging to another of Prince's vehicles, which had been sent for repairs shortly after Suttles went missing. The repair shop confirmed replacing a cargo compartment panel identical to the one found in the woods. Contained within the trash bag were items potentially belonging to Suttles, jewelry, a bracelet, and shoes. These items were promptly sent to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division's Forensic Services Laboratory for detailed analysis. The yogurt cup was tested and found to contain traces of drugs, including cyclobenzaprine, tramadol, and lorazepam. These drugs eerily match those found in Prince's home and prescribed to Nancy Rigo. In light of this incriminating evidence, law enforcement deployed a cadaver dog on October 10th to meticulously search the property. Although the search did not lead to the discovery of Suttles's body, the dog alarmingly picked up the scent of human remains in the vicinity of where the panel, trash bag, and tarp were located. While Suttles's remains continued to elude detection, the evidence that was accumulating cast a dark shadow over her fate and significantly bolstered the case against Prince. This array of evidence the hidden box with Suttles' belongings, the drugs linked to Prince, and the scent of human remains painted a haunting narrative. It not only intensified the mystery surrounding Suttles' disappearance, but also deepened the suspicions against Prince, gradually revealing a grim picture of the events that might have transpired.
Incarcerated, Daniel Glenn Prince clung to his version of events through two intensive interview sessions. He acknowledged his acquaintance with Edna Suttles and his frequent visits to Traveller's Rest. Initially, Prince asserted that on the day of Suttles' disappearance, their meeting was about hiring a private investigator for her daughter's divorce case. He insisted that he later returned Suttles Jeep to the Best Western parking lot to retrieve his own car, meticulously wiping down the Jeep to avoid being spotted by the investigator. Despite the mounting evidence against him, Prince's story remained unwavering. He seemed confident, perhaps believing the lack of direct evidence would work in his favor. However, the tide turned with the emergence of new, incriminating evidence. Confronted with this in a third interview, Prince realized his carefully constructed lies were collapsing. With his options dwindling, Prince tried to negotiate the terms of his confession, seeking to maintain some control over the situation. He expressed a readiness to face the inevitable, stating, there are things that have to happen, and there are things that are going to happen. I'm a realist, and I have accepted this. I would like a little bit of control over how they happen. He proposed revealing more details off the record. In the subsequent hour, Prince began to peel back layers of his deception, admitting to his crimes and resigning himself to the likelihood of a life sentence. In an attempt to avoid the death penalty, he struck a deal to provide crucial information previously unknown to the investigators, insisting on his lawyer's presence for the full disclosure. Crucially, Prince revealed the location of Suttles' body. In May 2022, following his directions, law enforcement officials unearthed her buried remains on a nearby property. Despite the passage of time, her body was positively identified, bringing a tragic closure to the case and confirming her unfortunate demise. Prince's subsequent confessions during the interview were chilling. He admitted to his involvement in the deaths of Dolores Sellers, Nancy Rigo, and Lee Goodman, exposing himself as a serial killer responsible for several unresolved murders. He described his participation in what he called the euthanasia of the elderly Sellers, with hints at Rigo's involvement. When Rigo, weighed down by guilt and contemplating going to the police became a threat. She was Prince's next victim. Utilizing the power of attorney she had given him, he deceitfully redirected her social security payments to his address. Seller's death, initially believed to be natural, was reclassified as a homicide following these revelations. Goodman, the third victim, disappeared in the interval between Rigo and Suttles. Prince claimed that a robbery attempt by Goodman led to a deadly altercation. He alleged disposing of her body in a secluded area, though there was no evidence to back up his robbery claim. The price for Prince's heinous actions was steep. By accepting a plea deal, he evaded a trial but was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He was confined to the United States Penitentiary Hasleton in Bruce Mills, West Virginia, a maximum security facility colloquially known as Misery Mountain. This ominous moniker aptly reflected the grim future awaiting a man responsible for such horrific crimes, marking the conclusion of a dark and tragic saga.